along this morning or this afternoon, wherever you are. Um, and thank you, Sam, for the invite to do this. Um, because I always love talking about British comics and I always love talking about Misty and I always love talking about Gothic. Um, so I've just finished a five-year project on Misty um, with a book that came out at the end of 2019 um, and a load of other free resources are all available on my website that you can see the link there in the bottom corner. Um, it was kind of a project that spiralled completely out of control like some sort of Frankenstein's monster. Um, it kind of started as a bit of archival research. I thought I'll just you know go to the British Library and dip into these comics um, and then I started tracking down some creators and they introduced me to more creators and the editorial team and so on um, so I ended up doing a lot of interviews I ended up doing kind of a small sort of quantitative kind of project where I looked at panel and page layout statistically loads of analysis of scripts and completed pages lots of online discussions and talking to great people on forums loads of close analysis and lots more so I can talk for a really long time about Misty and have been doing so for a little while now but today I'm going to try and speak to these three main areas um, and I'm really interested um, in your own thoughts and your own memories of British comics um, or indeed about other texts that could be considered a kind of gothic for girls perhaps more contemporary ones so please do use the chat to post your thoughts as we go along um, or indeed your comments on anything else whatsoever and we can have some discussion about this at the end. I'm going to aim for about 40 to 45 minutes and then hopefully we'll have sort of quarter of an hour or so to chat. Um, I said I've been working on Misty for the last five years, but actually it kind of goes back a lot further than that. Um, it was kind of originally inspired by my memory of a story that I read in a horror comic when I think I must have been about eight or nine years old. And it was a really short story. It was about a girl who wasn't very pretty and she was given a magic mirror and she was told that it would make her beautiful if she followed the instructions correctly. Um, and she did, and it worked. But as she got more beautiful, as so often happens, she also became mean and vain and kind of horrible in many ways. And then one day she did something wrong with the mirror. And when she woke up the next day and looked back in the mirror, her face was kind of all shattered and warped and um, yeah, just sort of you know melting and stuff. And the story ended with this sentence, like, how would you like to face yourself every day like this? Um, and it scared the absolute holy hell out of me. Um, and I threw the comic away and I avoided all horror for the next few years. Like, no joke, I went right back to my Care Bears comics, um, but I never forgot it. And when I was looking for a project after my first book on Gothic and comics, I sort of remembered it again and I decided to try and hunt it down. And that's how this whole thing kind of got started. So, of course, when I say British comics, um, oh, hang on, he's got my, there we go. Um, this is probably the sort of thing you think of. Um, kind of brightly coloured titles, kind of heroines who are sort of just struggling to fit in at the local ballet school or whatever, um, and kind of long running serials about that. You might also remember kind of problem pages, beauty tips, fashion features, um, plastic jewellery and other free gifts um, and dolls with cut out clothes that you'd always kind of mess up and mutilate in the process of trying to do that. And some of the most famous girls comics absolutely do fall into this mould. Um, for example, we've got things like the serial story, The Four Marys, that ran in Bunty um, from 1958 and the very first issue till Bunty finally finished in 2001. So it lasted like 40 years. Um, and this was about four girls who shared the same name and the same dorm um, at a boarding school and had a series of fairly dull adventures and clashes with their classmates. Um, or another good example might be the um, famous serial Bella at the Bar, which was in Tammy, in which plucky Bella Barlow kind of fights against all the odds to fulfil her dream of becoming a champion gymnast. But alongside this there was definitely a darker side and many of the kind of girls comic stories can also be read as exercises in psychological cruelty and victimization and sort of isolation and outsiderdom. So in the four Marys one of the lead characters is a scholarship girl, she's get picked on for this like people don't want to let her forget that. Um, Bella, her gymnastics kind of grow out of the fact that her aunt and uncle work her really hard and won't let her join the um, local gym. Um, as her uncle says here, attainment nothing, she's got to earn her keep. And Tammy gives us stories like Slaves of War from Farm, which is a particularly famous one, in which an orphan Kate is sent to the country to be physically and emotionally tortured by a vicious foster carer, Ma Thatcher, whose name is obviously entirely deliberate. So isolation, persecution, heartbreak and trauma, all kind of pretty standard themes in many of the weekly stories. And although heroines like Bella do actually achieve their dreams, other stories end in tragedy. For example, nothing ever goes right um, in Judy, in which our heroine Heather constantly tries to help people, but actually just is beset at every turn and set back. You know, she has multiple accidents, bullying, illness, and a series of unhappy homes, and ultimately she's killed in a car accident. 
So publisher John Sanders, who is one of the people I interviewed for this, um, describes a typical British girls comic story from the late 70s like this. <clears throat> He calls it a cry with me story, where Cinderella type heroines kind of suffer weekly setbacks that just consistently trash their dreams. Um, John Sanders became managing director of London Publishers IPC in 1978, and basically his role then was to try and grab a big share of the British comics market um, from the market leader DC Thompson up in Scotland. And the comics that dominated British children's entertainment for over 30 years came out of the back and forth between these two companies. It's a bit like Marvel and DC, but almost completely forgotten. Um, each new title kind of raised the stakes, either by trying to top the other publisher's last release, or by last release, sorry, or by kind of pushing the market in a completely new direction. So girls' comics at this point were insanely big business. Like they developed from school stories and perhaps sort of career protagonists um, into pop music and romance, um, into more traumatic and perilous kind Kind of tales like the sort I'm mentioning. By the 1970s, comic sales in England, um, in Britain, sorry, exceeded 10 million copies a week for the first time ever, and the market was evenly split between IPC and DC Thompson. So with that in mind, it's kind of amazing to think that the industry collapsed so completely towards the end of the 20th century. Today, actually only three of the original British comics are still in print, and none of them are girls' titles. So that's another reason I kind of wanted to research Misty. Um, it's an important part of what I would call a lost history. So I'm going to start, as I said, by saying a bit about how Misty came about and how it used gothic and horror to push girls comics publishing in new directions. Um, and then I'm going to look more closely at some of its stories and their use of gothic themes and archetypes. And then I'm going to wrap up by trying to suggest that the way it kind of combined terror and horror and fairy tale constructs a subgenre that I'm going to call gothic for girls. So Gina Whisker says that not everything that is gothic is horror, and I think many critics have tried to distinguish between these new turns, and you've probably covered some of this before. Um, there's a fair bit of disagreement. Definitions kind of vary wildly. Um, most often, I think it depends on the medium that we're talking about and perhaps the historical perspective that we're using. So a, a literary critic like Gina Whisker might say that horror is a branch of gothic writing which is something she said, um, but by contrast, film scholar um, Javier Dana Reyes defines Gothic as part of a wider crystallization of horror. Um, it doesn't help that critics, I think, have also been quite vague about what Gothic actually is. Um, often we might define it simply in opposition to something like the Enlightenment or perhaps just as a literature of fear. Um, and that's all very well, but what scares one person might not scare another. Um, so we kind of need textual criteria, I think, to define Gothic and horror. Writer around Radcliffe was obviously one of the first to try and classify fear into two different types, to break it down into terror, that kind of obscure, unseen source of fear, and horror, the shown atrocity that we might recoil from. And I think most Gothic scholars today are still agreeing with and using this distinction. So the terror Gothic kind of awakens our senses to areas that we fear to go to, um, but we must. Um, it kind of entices us with half hidden images um, and the promise or the threat of something more that we need to discover. Um, by contrast, I think horror Gothic shocks us with something grotesque or obscene. It just kind of entraps and overwhelms our senses. Um, so I've included these two covers from Misty as examples of what I'd call terror Gothic and horror Gothic. You know, both are conveying fear, um, but on the left, the source is unknown and unseen, creating terror. On the right, we can see exactly what is menacing us from the television sense. And um, if we've got any sense, we recoil, I think, with horror. Um, debate in those terms is, of course, kind of a lecture in itself. So although I'm happy to unpick it a bit more and let's chat about it at the end. Um, today, I'm going to use Gothic at a kind of really wide sense, just to refer to a mode of creation that creates fear in the form of both terror and horror. And for me, I think Gothic is a kind of contradiction. It repels us, it horrifies us, but it also fascinates and attracts us. It's named after barbarians, but it was initially the kind of domain of the literary elite. Gothic literature has been treated as trash, um, but it's now canonized and respected as well. Um, its culture and its style, I think, could be described as introspective, but it's also confrontational and performative. Uh, so Gothic texts, I think, give us kind of too much information, the supernatural, but also they give us too little. You know, they kind of hide origins and mysteries and so on. And within Gothic, I absolutely recognize these distinctions that Anne Radcliffe draws between horror and terror. And alongside that, I think I'd also recognise horror as a kind of cinematic and literary genre that um, privileges that second type of fear. So 
This is the advert for Misty that appeared in Tammy in 1978, a week before it was launched. Um, I've put the text by the side because it's not great quality. And straight away, I think we can see the way that adjectives and kind of dynamic punctuation are loaded into this copy. And all of them are themed around the Gothic. You know, even the word fantastic, which obviously carries that secondary meaning of fantasy as well. Um, as a whole, they conjure up terror as they refer to kind of mysterious and weird and strange things, and they raise questions that we can't answer. And this is part of the reason that although Misty called itself a mystery comic, um, today I'm going to argue that it is in fact a gothic text. So it was first published on 4 February 1978. It would run for just under two years, spanning 101 issues and then three holiday specials. Uh, Misty then merged into Tammy, which was pretty common practice with the British comics to boost sales once they started to fall a bit. Um, but then it swiftly faded from view because basically all its content was toned down or removed um, because Tammy was perhaps more popular. Um, there were also eight annuals that ran until 1986 and a series of reprints in both the UK and abroad. Um, it's an anthology comic, um, like most British comics were at the time, and in each issue you kind of get, um, well actually it looks like this, so if you've never seen kind of, you know, old British comics, um, it looks like this, and in each issue you get a welcome from Misty herself on the, on the inside cover there, um, and then you get um, a kind of selection of about six comic strip stories that are either an instalment of a longer serial or it's just a kind of standalone tale. There's a recurring comedy cartoon called Miss T about a witch whose spells always go wrong. Um, one or two pages of letters, um, some feature text articles on ghosts and myths and legends and so on, and a page or two of horoscopes and adverts. So Misty is best remembered as a Pat Mills creation, and it's true that Pat came up with the original idea for this comic. Um, he's been called the godfather of British comics. He's had a kind of massive impact on the industry, particularly in the 1970s. Um, he was behind the creation and the launch of titles like Tammy, Jinty, Battle Picture Weekly, um, the Notorious Action, which ran for not very long before it was banned, and of course 2000 AD. Um, and Misty grew for him his idea um, that he stated up here for a girls horror comic that would have longer stories. Um, so all the installments and single stories in Misty are four pages rather than the usual three pages um, that was happened in other comics. Um, and that extra space would kind of allow it to have more splash pages. So big kind of images and dramatic and sort of dynamic layouts, um, rather like the ones that Pat and his art editor, Doug Church, were using on 2000 AD. Um, and like you can see here in the opening page, Pages to these two stories from um, the first issue of Misty. But John Sanders and John Purdy, the IPC directors, didn't want a horror comic. They wanted a mystery title. Um, this might have been because IPC had just the year before gone through quite a lot of controversy from publishing action that I just mentioned. It was very violent. It gained quite a lot of negative press attention. It was withdrawn quite quickly. Um, I also mentioned the competition between DC Thompson and IPC. Um, DC Thompson had launched Spellbound, their own supernatural mystery story paper, um, just the year before. Um, so, you know, IPC would be looking for something to compete with that. Um, we'll see as this talk goes on whether the two Johnnies, John Sanders and John Purdy, actually got the comic they wanted. Um, Pat Mills had also launched quite a lot of successful titles for IPC by this point. So he wanted a cut of the profits on this new title, Misty, which was refused. So he turned down the opportunity to edit it. So the idea was then passed to Will Prigmore, who was the group editor for the Girls Adventure comics. And he put together a team of writers to start kind of compiling some stories and some ideas. An editorial team was put together with Wilf editing the first few issues and then it was going to be handed over to Malcolm Shaw. Um, a writer, Bill Harrington, was its sub-editor, um, Jack Cunningham was its art editor and Ted Andrews was its editorial assistant. And that was all you got to kind of run a British comic in those days, a small team of four. Um, Writers and artists weren't credited on the story. Most of this was done freelance um, and the publishers kept all the original materials and they owned all the copyright. Scripts were written by the editor and the sub-editor as well as freelance writers. Um, and the artwork, as I say, was produced by freelance artists who mainly came from um, free European studios. And these artists were responsible for the majority of the artwork in British comics of the time, um, and they were extremely skilled. It's interesting to note as well, actually, that many of them also worked on American horror comics around this point, um, for example, for Warren Publishing, um, and they didn't tone down their style very much for, certainly for Misty anyway. 
So at this point in time, um, Misty had no title, um, as far as I can tell. It was really just the idea of a mystery or horror comic and a collection of story pitches. And I've seen some scripts for the first issue, and I can confirm that, as Pat Mills has claimed, his ideas were definitely being toned down. So, for example, the story Roots, um, which is about a girl, a girl called Jill, who goes to stay in a village with her granddad for the summer, but soon notices that there's weird and uncanny things happening everywhere. Um, there's strange things outside her window at night, strange people standing around um, and ultimately she discovers that all the people who live there are kind of horrifying hybrids who've literally kind of put down roots into the ground and this final reveal sort of makes really quite good use of the comics medium it takes place after a page turn and we've got the shadows in the composition kind of all emphasizing Jill's shocked reaction um, as well as the broken panel border and the use of perspective to highlight her grandfather's growing leg um, this was considered too shocking an ending for issue one of Misty, um, so the editorial team added this little reassuring panel um, that's been sort of pasted on in the bottom right there, um, in which Jill decides that actually she's fine with all of this and she'd love to just stay there. Um, Another example would be um, the story Moodstone, in which Kathy cons an old lady out of a Moodstone ring that changes colour according to your mood, um, but it sucks all the colour out of her world. And that, again, combined ideas taken from both Pat and Wilf. So Pat also wrote a story called The Banana King, um, title notwithstanding, it's actually quite a scary one about a terrifying spider who emerges from a box of bananas stalking a young girl around her house. And again, this one was toned down. His original script's on the left here, and it's got descriptions like, show her radio knocked over, maybe into the bath to suggest strongly that she snuffed it. Um, and there's a final kind of horrifying panel um, of the malevolent banana king sort of covered in red leg spiders and just deliberately putting more spiders in bunches of bananas to be sent off to people. Needless to say, all of this was toned down again. Um, the evil antagonist Banana King was removed entirely for the final version of the story. And the story was retitled Red and White Terror um, and given a twist ending where, although the heroine is kind of menaced by um, what looks like a real spider, it turns out to be a toy one that her brother has planted there. Um, even though it's got this sort of re unreassuring final panel where actually there is a real spider still lurking in the house and it's scuttling towards her hand kind of hanging down out of the bath. So as it was scripted, The Banana King was sort of a story of building tension. It had this sort of gruesome detailed spider and this kind of final horrifying image of a kind of evil antagonist. Um, and although the published version does contain some moments of horror, because it's got some quite detailed drawings of a spider, it's more a story about tension that kind of utilizes terror, I think, the threat of something unseen or about to happen as it kind of scuttles around the house behind our heroine. And I think changes like this help to reposition Misty as um, something more terrifying than gruesome and to brand it as something more kind of suspenseful and mysterious rather than as a horror comic. And this again was aided by the kind of titles it picked for its stories. Um, they didn't refer to terror or horror that much actually. Um, instead, they'd sort of generally tend towards the mysterious and suggestive. They might reference a mysterious item, you know, the jukebox, the dummy or something like that. Or they might make puns on the story's content um, for example, something like examination nerves or prize possession. <clears throat> and I think this mood of kind of mystery and suspense um, was also reinforced by the prominence that it gave to its serial stories. And those followed a template that were quite similar to a lot of other girls' comics. They're kind of stories of personal growth or sort of self-acceptance, um, and they fall into two types because they've got a supernatural twist in Misty. Um, so firstly, protagonists may discover like a hidden aspect of themselves. You know, they might suddenly begin to suspect they are reincarnated um, or that they're getting visions they can't explain or they have a power like telekinesis or telepathy or something. Um, and that hidden kind of new power is something they either have to escape or they have to overcome and try and control. Um, so, for example, Moonchild, which is basically a rewrite of Stephen King's Carrie, um, in which Rosemary White must learn to understand and control her telekinetic powers. Um, or the secret world of Sally Maxwell, in which Sally kind of accidentally gains telepathic abilities and then she has to escape government agents before finally accepting her new abilities. The second type of serial story has a protagonist who is trapped in a strange or unhappy situation. Um, so a, night, a good example might be Nightmare Academy, as I've shown here, in which Sharon is sent to a creepy new boarding school where she becomes convinced the headmistress is a vampire. Like the Misty advert, you can see the opening rhetoric here is all about creating terror again through the unknown and the unseen. You know, we get the exterior of the building seen from a distance, along with all this talk of secrets and aloofness. 
Um, another good example of this second story type might be the Sentinels, um, in which our lead character Jan enters an abandoned tower block and then discovers it's actually a pathway to a terrifying alternate world, um, one in which the Nazis have won the Second World War and Britain is, is occupied. So these opening pages to the Sentinels, because it's a great example to have a quick look at, um, are absolutely characteristic of how Misty launched its tales. So we get a large splash page or kind of first panel, followed by like dramatic and dynamic page layouts. Um, so very seldom do we get like a regular grid or anything like that. It's all angled panel borders um, and, you know, kind of contrasts of very heavy lines um, or borders that have been removed completely. Um, and frequent kind of use, yeah, of those sort of borderless pictures. Um, we might also think about um, the way that characters' arms and legs often break panel borders, which we can see in the first and the third picture here. Um, and these, as well as speech balloons, are all, are all kind of used to sort of lead our eye sort of down and across the page. Um, and the story content in The Sentinels is just as dramatic as this sort of layout. Um, so on this second page, Jan has stopped a group of girls who are bullying her friend Julie, and they're trying to drag her into this deserted tower block which is supposed to be haunted um, it's revealed that julie's best friend's family disappeared in there some time back and then jan returns home to find out that their landlord is throwing her and her family out onto the street that's quite a lot for one page um, and quite a good setup um, and the rest of part one of course then has jan and her family decide to take shelter in the deserted creepy tower block um, but things quickly go wrong um, jan runs off after a dog sees a man who looks exactly like her father but then discovers her father hasn't left the flat all evening um, and then part two gives us more weirdness later that night and also the next day when jan's mother has an encounter with a girl who looks like jan but isn't so lots of doubling kind of ideas starting to emerge here it's not until part four, though, so we've you know, had three issues, 12 pages of building up tension before this, um, that we finally get to the truth that Jan's become trapped in this alternate world through the tower block where Britain's occupied by Nazis and in which she kind of consistently meets doubles of herself, her family and her friends. It is a surprisingly dramatic discovery that's preceded by a helicopter chase, which may not be something we expect in girls' comics of this time. Um, and again, after Jan escapes into the sewers, a really horrifying page on the right, um, apologies for this, where her pet dog tiger is eaten by rats. Um, and that's at the bottom left of the corner of that page. Again, the layout is kind of really emphasizing the drama, I think. You know, look at all those heavy contrasting panel borders. Um, and it's really kind of foregrounding the mountain horror because we've got these inset and circular and borderless panels. They're all used to make Tiger's death the kind of central subject of the page as a whole. You know, Tiger's death is literally foregrounded in the bottom left um, and the girl's kind of horrified gaze is what leads our eye down to it. Um, so they as we are both kind of looking on sort of helplessly to what's happening. Um, I'll come back to the Sentinels in a bit later on because it's kind of littered with doubles and fragmented and uncanny experiences that are going to tie in quite nicely to what I'm going to talk about in the second bit of this lecture. Um, but yeah, it's, you know, because of that, I think it is much more, it conjures much more gothic horror rather than a kind of simple sci-fi adventure. As well as its serials and what I remember most clearly about Misty is its one-off stories. Um, these one-shot tales were kind of loosely based on the strange story, which was a type of tale that had appeared in a lot of girls' comics, um, often introduced by a kind of host character um, who would tell us a creepy or unexplained sort of supernatural tale. But Misty, I think, pushed this format to the edge. Um, arguably, it used its single stories to give its readers horror kind of skating under the radar, um, complementing the terror, I think. So Misty's single stories are best described as vicious cautionary tales, I think, in which a not always guilty protagonist is punished generally for a misuse of magic. Um, the stories are brutal in their outcomes and often very excessive and often kind of contain a heavy dose of irony or poetic justice. So shoplifters might be changed into shop dummies. Um, teachers will haunt, you know, cheating pupils. Vandals are trapped in the windows or buildings that they have smashed and so on. Um, this example is pretty interesting, Dead End. Um, it follows the classic misty visual layout again of a large opening panel and then plenty of kind of angular and inset and irregular panel shapes. It's about a girl called Kath Clark, who is a bully. And with the help of her friend Jane, who was a bit more reluctant, um, they swiftly progress to mugging an old lady, as you can see on the second page here. Um, the woman runs off into the road, she's hit by a bus and they later discover that she has died. 
The story then takes a kind of spooky turn and both Jane and Kaff separately see the woman's ghost walking down the same street. And shortly after, Kaff goes for a job interview as a home help, and she's terrified when that same old lady answers the door again. She runs into the road and she is hit by the same bus, um, after which it's revealed that the woman in the house was actually the twin sister of the one who died. So we've got some pretty hardcore delinquency, two deaths, including that of a child, and a hefty dose of supernatural fear. Um, and just as the misty serials kind of gave us terror through unanswered questions and weekly cliffhangers that sort of ratcheted up the tension, many of the single stories like this one, I think, raised the tension in the same way with these sort of mysterious and unexplained events kind of snowballing from each other. Um, but others also gave us a fair dose of horror as they confronted us with a shocking final Final image or scenario. Um, these single stories pulled no punches and certainly my memory of the one about the magic mirror stayed with me for over 30 years so I would obviously vouch for their impact. Um, it's shown on the top left here we can see Linda's shattered face in the foreground and her mother who's fainted um, on the bathroom floor in the background. Um, the middle image is a final page from a story called The Dryad Girl. It's about a wood nymph who desperately wants to be mortal so she won't be so lonely, but when she gets a wish, she's so hideous, she scares everyone away. Um, and finally, The Pig People, um, in which our um, lead character, Lorena, steals an amulet from her friend Pearl, but it's come from an ancient cult um, called the Worshippers of the Pig. Um, she discovers it's got a power, and when she makes a wish to be beautiful, this becomes true, but the beauty it gives her is in accordance with the Pig People's idea of beauty, so she ends up looking like that in the bottom right. Um, and very quickly, just to summarise, um, finally, Misty also contained two comedy series, as I've said, Miss T and Wendy the Witch, and they're kind of short slapstick tales of one page or less about a witch whose spells often go wrong. Um, they're drawn in quite a different style from the edge of the rest of the comic, um, perhaps one that we might associate more with traditional British humour comics like the Beano or the Dandy. Um, the characters are more childlike, it kind of maybe edges a bit more towards the grotesque because of that, with caricatured and exaggerated features. Um, and there's a lot of kind of ephemera, um, you know, indicating special effects, impacts, sounds, even narrative asides and so on. You don't need me to point out that these three different types of content are quite different, right? Um, so readers must have been quite skilled in negotiating the different registers required to read this comic every week and finding their way through the comic, I think was a tricky task and one that possibly needed a guide. And this was another way that Misty kind of innovated and developed on the existing tactics of girls comics and branded itself as a mysterious and supernatural title rather than an outright horror. So it created a fictional editor um, in the form of Misty herself. So each issue opens with this full page welcome from Misty on the inside cover, um, drawn by the artist Shirley Bellwood. Um, and these pages um, are one thing I remember quite clearly. They create this kind of mythical figure of Misty, um, who names herself a child of the mists, and she is here to bring us tales of mystery and marvel each week um, from her realm. And the way they do this is fascinating. I could talk about it all day, but I'll just flag up a few key points. Um, firstly, Bellwood's imagery, which is full of natural Gothic tropes like forest scenes or crumbling ruins, bats and moons and pools of water, mist, of course, um, and leaves and so on on almost all the pages. Um, continuing the terror gothic sort of vibe, Misty herself is often obscured in some way, like her full body appears less than half the time and she's often sort of translucent or hides some part of her face in shadow or in profile. Um, but she addresses us in kind of a sort of friendly, reassuring way. Um, she always, almost always signs herself off as your friend Misty. She often frames um, reading the comic as kind of undertaking a journey. She uses words like travel with me or venture, quest or, you know, just come with me. Um, the atmosphere is kind of loaded with gothic language. She speaks of shadows lengthening, of spines tingling, of night creatures and moons and bats and midnight and mist. Um, and she encourages the reader to kind of be brave. Um, you know, the tone treads a line between fear and excitement, I think. Um, we're often invited to take her hand, to look into her eyes, um, to step with her and listen and so on. So there's a real sort of sense of physicality in that language as well. Things are breathtaking, they're spine tingling. Um, and all these welcomes, I think, were likely written by the comics editor and the layouts were put together and the calligraphy done by hand um, by its art editor, Jack Cunningham. 
One point of interest is that there's only 54 original Bellwood sketches um, for the 101 issues of Misty that exist. They're often recombined, they're flipped, they're mirrored, they're cropped and so on to make a new page. And this is sometimes really blatant, as you can see here. Um, sometimes the repetition is even more immediate. So issue 14 just simply crops and reverses the image from the last week and just adds an extra bat. Um, so yeah, there's a definite kind of value for money approach going on here. Um, Mist is actually based on Shirley Bellwood herself, um, but she also looks a lot like a kind of new age witch figure that I think emerged sort of in 1960s counterculture. Long dark hair, flowing robes, a kind of star charm necklace and so on, and surrounded by this wild and natural imagery. And I think her gentle and soothing qualities might be able to be read um, as part of the 70s kind of reclaiming of the witch by feminist counterculture. So rather than a kind of wizened old, old crone, the pagan witch kind of carries connotations of nature and tranquility and spirituality associated with kind of wild and deserted landscapes and with journeys and sort of liminal states and thresholds and crossings. And all of that, I think, comes across in Misty's words and in her presentation. She told us very little about herself, um, although readers desperately, desperately wanted to know more. And the letters pages are almost entirely composed of people asking more questions about Misty. Um, Misty's identity and the details of where she live are constructed in this way through kind of vague answers um, that hint towards a mythology, um, but don't ever really define anything. And her role as a kind of spirit guide in a realm that shadows ours, um, as she claims in this reply um, on the right here, um, emerges in this way. And it's a quite a big departure from the other British girls comics of the time. Um, from the 1950s onwards, just to put it in context, um, British girls comics had mostly used girls names as titles. So this was often attached to a cover girl image such as Tammy or Judy who appear on the cover of loads of issues of their comic. But sometimes it also extended into the interior of the comic as well. Um, for example, you might get an editorial claiming to be from that particular character um, or a letters page in which some, you know, in which it was labeled um, after them. Um, but none of these characters ever really got developed. Um, and it's been claimed that Misty sort of faded out of sight once the comic merged with Tammy because it only really had a cover girl. Um, but I think actually the mythology behind Misty's character and the level of direct interaction that readers had with her in the welcome and answering stuff on the letters page and the story she built up around herself is actually quite different from the other girls comics. And it stems from her sort of Gothic roots. Of course, host characters aren't really a new idea to horror across many media um, or comics. They date back to like 1930s radio plays, such as The Witch's Tale, hosted by old Nancy, the Witch of Salem. Um, and perhaps the most famous comics examples, of course, come from the American publishers EC, whose ghoul lunatics hosted um, these comics in the early 1950s. And they would welcome readers to the comics. They'd kind of introduce and wrap up each tale. They provide a sort of distancing frame around the stories um, with terrible puns and jokes mostly that would shield the child reader from kind of horrible events. But horror hosts were another key feature of British girls comics as well. Um, they were more developed than the cover girls. They would often limit themselves to the scary sections of the comic um, and they'd introduce a weekly kind of tale or installment. Um, and some examples here um, from the storyteller um, to Diana's Man in Black um, to Damien Dark um, and Gypsy Rose. Um, the early ones are all older men with a kind of authoritative appearance and explicit kind of horror markers. You know, the storyteller might look a bit like a doctor or a psychiatrist. The man in black is clearly just a vampire. Um, and Damien Dark is a sort of romantic kind of, you know, figure with his ruffled shirt and so on. Um, but then they do give way to more diverse figures with more complex abilities like Gypsy Rose, who first appears in 1977. Um, but all these figures kind of told one-off supernatural stories, a template that, as I mentioned before, came to be known as the strange story, and that was the, probably the sort of thing that Misty was adapting and riffing off um, in its one-off stories. The Misty one-off tales are the things that really interest me, um, because although it branded itself as mystery, I think they were very gothic and very hard-hitting. So I want to look at a few of them a bit more closely now and kind of focus on how they reframe gothic themes and motifs for a younger audience, um, particularly one on the cusp of puberty, perhaps. Um, and I'm going to speak about three main areas. So the gothic archetypes that appear, the use of doubles and the uncanny. So in an article on Misty and British comics, Jacqueline Rayner talks about all the ghosts and zombies and eerie beings that we found in its pages. And I did look at Misty with this in mind, um, kind of trying to see how often archetypes actually appeared. And to crunch the numbers quickly, actual figures like zombies and witches only appear in about 40% of the Misty stories. 
And this makes it quite different from horror contemporaries like the American horror comics I've just mentioned or other British horror titles like Scream. You know, they have a lot more of these monsters. And it also aligns Misty, I think, with a older, more traditional view of Gothic, um, particularly the kind of first phase of the Gothic novel in the late 18th or early 19th century, um, which Catherine Spooner has kind of pointed out in, in which monsters were kind of virtually unknown in contrast to perhaps more contemporary Gothics where monsters seem to pop up all over the place. Of the archetypes that do appear in Misty, the three most common that I found from surveying all its stories um, were the witch, the ghost and the vampire. And I've already spoken a bit about how Misty talks to the feminist reclaiming of the witch. Um, along similar lines, it's worth noting that witches in the Misty stories can be evil antagonists, but even when that happens, they're most often given some justification and quite often they're shown as victims as well. So a good example might be the story, Was It Just a Game? Nina is bullied at school, everyone calls her a witch, but she gets her revenge on the bullies as a series of accidents happen on the school trip. Um, but the final panel shows her kind of enacting these with her dolls. Um, a more straightforward sort of witch's villain story um, could be what's on the other side in which an evil witch travels from medieval times to possess disobedient Peggy while she watches TV and traps her on the other side of the screen um, as Peggy kind of screams frantically here, no mum it isn't me, she isn't me um, and her mum just switches off the set and silences her abruptly and we assume Peggy is not coming back. Um, I don't have time to speak about vampires too but I would like to say a bit about ghosts um, critics like Diana Wallace have described women as a kind of haunted and ghostly presence in Gothic, claiming that the dominant idea of female Gothic is that of woman as dead or as buried alive within male power structures that kind of render her ghostly and ineffectual. Um, and Horner also kind of stresses that many female authors use that idea of ghostliness to express that sense of uh, lack of agency. And this is literalized, I think, in 16 of the Misty stories, where the protagonist either becomes a ghost or finds out that she's one already. Um, so, for example, the story Don't Look in the Mirror, where orphans Kate and Tom and Beth go to stay with their estranged aunt, who tells them, don't look in the mirror in the attic. Of course they do. Um, when Tom disappears, his sisters investigate and they see their deceased parents in the mirror and they realise actually they're all already dead. They're just figments of her aunt's imagination. So they all decide to step into the mirror and join the rest of their family. Ghosts also feature as helpers and antagonists, as well as protagonists. Um, in the short serial Hangman's Alley, JC and her sister Mel move to a new house. Um, JC is terrified by a ghostly figure she sees with the face of her sister. It turns out there's two ghosts, um, one of a girl who was wrongfully hung for stealing a necklace and another who died in the house of smallpox. And JC agrees to help the first one, but she's continually persecuted by the second one who also attacks Mel and sets the house on fire. Um, but it's when JC is trying to get out she smashes the wall down, um, discovers a confession and the stolen necklace, and she's able to set both ghosts to rest. So just from those few examples, I want to kind of stress how many times the uncanny idea of the double is used. You know, we've got, in Was It Just a Game, we've got Nina's dolls that she's using as uncanny replicas of the girls that bully her. Peggy looks through the TV scene, see, screen and sees her own body possessed by the witch, and she's doubled in that way in multiple panels. Um, mirror reflections are used, obviously, in Don't Look in the Mirror. The Hangman's Alley ghost has Mel's face, and even that's doubled again by the realisation there's a second ghost. And we could think back to some of the other examples I mentioned earlier, you know, the two tower blocks of the Sentinels, the old ladies that turn out to be twin sisters. Us. Even Miss T's Celtic magic trick in that um, very um, quick ship strip I showed you where she pulls a rabbit out of her hat but it's holding another Miss T holding another rabbit and, and so on. So this sort of doubling and replication I think is an obvious example of the uncanny, um, that term for the familiar made strange um, which Freud defines as that kind of class of the terrifying that leads back to something long known to us and once very familiar. And many of the misty stories kind of revolve around a familiar object or setting that's made weird or unnatural. Um, the single story of the family is another good example of this. Judy becomes suspicious of her father's science experiments. Um, she convinces herself he's making a monster and she tries to investigate, but then it's revealed to us that she's actually the uncanny replica, a robot experiment that her father has been working on. 
So the idea of a hidden secret, something kind of buried within that creates the strange and uncanny also relates to the female Gothic. And many of the other Misty stories, particularly the serials have, as I said, girls discovering some sort of hidden aspect within themselves, whether it's telekinesis in Moonchild um, or Sally Maxwell's telepathy. And their struggle to control this or come to terms with it is what drives the narrative forward. And it doesn't take a great imaginative leap to see resonance here with the kind of processes of puberty, you know, uncontrollable changes to your body or your mood. Um, new things emerging, like the slow, frightening cycle of change that Nick, our lead character Nicholas Scott experiences in The Cult of the Cat. And these struggles take place in both the serials and the single stories. Um, although protagonists in the one-off tales are much less likely to escape, um, and many of those stories do end very unhappily, um, like the family, um, leaving the protagonist kind of trapped in some way or with some aspect of her identity erased or threatened. Um, it's notable in this final page of the family that I've shown here that Judy's face is completely hidden there. She's described as no child at all by the narration. So I think the Misty stories can be read as gothic metaphors for the experiences of a teenage audience. Um, identity is often attacked or threatened through ghostliness or from uncanny settings and objects and doubling, kind of creating this atmosphere of doubt and uncertainty. Um, I think Misty doesn't just convey explicit girlhood worries, like friendship problems and bullying and so on, although these do feature in the stories, it also reconfigures um, sort of gothic concerns about identity, about control, about authenticity and falsity, um, but it reimagines them as metaphors for negotiating puberty and femininity. Um, so I'll just wrap up maybe by looking at one story closely because I'm conscious of the, of the time. Um, <clears throat> so the story Old Collie's Collection is another really good example. And in this tale, our lead character Shirley tries to steal a snow globe from Old Collie's antique shop, but she becomes magically trapped in one and made part of his collection. And I think the story combines a number of elements of the female Gothic. It's full of uncanny visuals. We've got the snow globes themselves with their tiny people and landscape in them, and even the setting itself, whose kind of cobbled streets and old fashioned street lamps could you know, seem out of place when compared to the gang's sort of contemporary clothing and speech. So the familiar is kind of being made strange again here. And this visual strangeness, I think, is echoed by the story's themes. They kind of speak to what we might call the feminine carcerelle, where the female body is either imprisoned or is itself felt and experienced as a prison. Um, and Gothic theorists like Diana Wallace have used Sigmund Freud's work to, to define live burial as a really powerful way of representing that female experience in Gothic, particularly when it comes to something like marriage or inequality. So when she enters the hidden door between um, in the shop and gets trapped in a snow globe, Shirley literally becomes an object. She becomes a chattel, the possession of an older man. And her fate can also then be read as abject, that experience of kind of identity disruption, where the borders between subject and object kind of break down. She's enclosed within this huge glass orb. It turns her into an object. It silences her voice. You know, the story's final panel is just her doing this kind of wordless scream. And it removes all her agency as old colleague kind of holds the globe in his, in his hand and sort of leers down at her. And the use of perspective at the bottom of the page on the left also extends this experience, I think, to the young female reader. And the image also appears on the cover of this ish particular issue. So it blurs those kind of breaks down those boundaries between where the story world might, you know, realistically be expected to end. So in many ways, then, I think the content of Misty speaks to established ideas that underpin um, the Gothic and particularly the treatment of women in Gothic, particularly um, things like uncanny experiences, um, transgression and spectrality. Um, but it also does take a lot of ideas from its cultural context. Um, so just for the final few minutes, I suppose I want to say a bit more about children's horror and Gothic in the late 1970s um, and to suggest that Misty's relationship to that, um, as well as the way it articulates classic fairy tales, create what I call a kind of Gothic for girls. So very quickly, there were kind of significant changes to horror in the 70s, a sort of move towards pure horror, something without explanation or backstory. I'm thinking about stories like Jaws um, or, you know, um, The Exorcist and so on, um, and extends into films like The Texas Chainsaw Massacre and Halloween. Um, also a move towards teenage concerns, you know, um, babysitters and, and younger protagonists, teenagers appearing as both victims and heroes and the um, ambiguous or unhappy endings that introdu were introduced in the 60s also kind of continued. There's also following that trend of horror getting younger, I think a rise of gothic um, for children on British TV um, and some of the examples you might think of as shown here. 
We also had the rise of the public information film, um, which is a wonderful area for, explana uh, for explanation. Um, you know, the equivalent of a US public service announcement, short films shown on daytime TV. Um, and I was born in 77. I remember lots of these being shown um, to warn us off all sorts of things, whether from climbing electricity pylons to smuggling animals into the country to playing on farmland or water and so on. Um, these films are really, really brutal. You can watch tons of them on YouTube if you're so inclined inclined. Um, they are quite often heavily coded as gothic, um, so Dark and Lonely Water that's playing at the top is narrated by Donald Pleasance. They often use kind of quite tense or gothic -y music, and in many ways they're exactly the same sort of cautionary tale as we recognise in the misty single stories. Um, they often contain a kind of ambivalent or bad ending, an ironic twist of fate, and a tendency to sort of high drama or excess. And Misty uses those sorts of twist endings and ironic punishments um, in nearly half of its sort of single story content. Um, but I suppose we might ask how surprising or shocking that is to regular readers because it occurs so often, you know, and instead perhaps we might think about it as a kind of ritual, what Timothy Jones calls the Gothic carnival. Um, the way in which readers use Gothic texts as a kind of source of wicked pleasure um, rather than to engage with serious psychological ideas. Um, and Jones draws attention to the kind of excessive hyperbolic style that characterizes this sort of gothic and the way it might rely on character types or stereotypes rather than fully developed figures. And I think Misty's protagonists are exactly like this. You know, they're kind of tied to a single personality trait. As we've seen, Calf in Dead End is a bully, Peggy in What's on the Other Side is disobedient. In both cases, the reasons why they're like this aren't ever explored. You know, the characters are just a transgression waiting to happen. And in that way, I think they do resemble a lot of the kind of stripped down horror of the 1970s. But they also put me in mind a fairy tale, um, which kind of takes place in that abstract or undefined space, um, you know, in places that are not seldom named once upon a time or maybe in a galaxy far, far away. And again, the Misty Girls kind of exist in that sort of space. You know, they're, um, where they actually live is not often named or if it is, it's somewhere made up. Um, and their worlds are kind of juxtaposed sort of kitchen sink realism, but also the disruptive kind of presence of magic. So we might think then just to conclude about how these ideas relate to fantasy and fairy tale aimed at girls, which consistently combine dark themes, I think, with fairy tale motifs. From Alice in Wonderland to Twilight, we've got stories that revolve around protagonists, awake, a female protagonists awakening in strange new worlds and struggling to kind of negotiate or to escape these. Um, critics like David Rudd or Chloe Buckley trace this kind of gothic strand in children's writing, you know, from the Victorian period right up to the present day, um, and point out that many of these books kind of tend towards magical realism and deal with issues of isolation and estrangement and incarceration. And I think these sorts of dark fairy tale atmospheres continue to be picked up and rearticulated in a lot of contemporary children's literature. Uh, many of the works deal with isolated and lonely protagonists and contain tropes of transformational identity exploration within a frame that kind of draws on pre-existing knowledge of fairy tale and horror. I'm not suggesting like all gothic narratives for young girls follow this pattern, just that there are similarities in lots of the most popular ones. So you might think about Buffy the Vampire Slayer, True Blood, Twilight, Once Upon a Time, Wicked, Maleficent and so on. And all those examples, you know, have a backdrop taken from horror or fairy tale, give us a protagonist who is isolated or special in some way, and who struggled to kind of understand and negotiate her new identity underpins that, um, just like the Misty stories. And this emphasis, I think, distinguishes um, what I'd call Gothic for girls from children's Gothic or female Gothic. So Misty might have branded itself as mystery, but it dosed its readers with terror and horror. Um, and I think because of this, I've got no hesitation calling it a gothic text. Um, I've tried to draw attention to how it kind of developed existing strategies of girls' comics, like the cover girl and the horror host, and how it kind of manipulated their generic templates. Um, and also how that reworking sort of drew on classic gothic themes like uncanny strangeness and doubling and archetypes like the ghost, um, which are all used to interrogate and destabilize female identity as these covers um, kind of suggest. Um, and by bringing all these sorts of elements together, um, you know, kind of also engaging with the new norms of 70s horror, um, but also looking back to classic fairy tale structures and moods, um, I think Misty kind of created what I'd call Gothic for Girls, you know, something that tells stories that explore and enact identity through isolated protagonists um, who must learn to 
control or accept some aspect of themselves to escape danger. Um, so I think in that sense, it kind of speaks to girlhood as a uncanny and sort of liminal experience, um, interrogating ex expectations about it and reimagining fears into new and terrifying forms. I'm going to stop there because I'm very conscious of the time. Um, thank you all very much. I'm really interested to hear yeah, any thoughts, comments and say more about any aspect of that.